My involvement with uh, disordered Schrodinger equations came mostly from this building of the collaboration called the Simons Wave Collaboration. I'll mention a little bit more who's involved at the very end. Um, this is a big ongoing project, and the work I'm talking about is work in, project, in um, progress. So I'm going to start by talking about the Schrodinger equation and wave localization. So there's a, an equation that's certainly very well known here, and I guess uh, on a statue in the entrance to the university. Um, so let's just quickly go through the Schrodinger equation. So we have some constants there. So I'm going to differ myself from physicists. Uh, the mathematicians usually ignore the constants, even though they have very particular values. So Planck's constant, h-bar, and the mass of... So typically, Schrodinger's equation are often is used for small particles like uh, an electron. So we could imagine that to be the mass of the electron. And I'm not going to be focusing so much on those. We won't be going into to asymptotic regimes, assuming those are tending to zero or something like that. There's one constant I won't forget, which is the imaginary unit, the square root of negative one. That changes everything. Otherwise, this would be some sort of heat equation. But uh, it's not. Um, then we have v. That's a real valued function, not complex, um, which is uh, potential. And that you should think of as giving you the environment. x is a point in space, t is a moment of time, and v of x tells you the environment around x, which the particle is facing. Uh, and since I told you that um, v is real, and all these constants are real except the imaginary unit, that means that the unknown c must be complex. It couldn't be real or uh, other than zero. It couldn't be real and still satisfy the equa equation. What is the unknown c? Well, of course, that's the wave function. And that's a difficult thing to say exactly what c is. So it's a complex function that the general thing they, that said about it is that it tells you everything about the state of the, uh, the system at the time t is somehow encoded in c of tx. The specific, the, probably the most concrete interpretation of the wave function is the Bohr's interpretation. If you take the modulus of that complex function and square it, that's a non-dimensional positive real function, which is a probability distribution, which is a probability that the particle will find itself at the point x. Um, by the way, since the modulus of c squared is equal to 1, we need solutions for which that's satisfied. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a probability distribution. But fortunately, if that's satisfied at some initial time, it's automatically satisfied for all times. It comes just from the self-adjoint form of the operator on the right-hand side. So this was published in a series of four papers. So Quantisierung als Eigenwerkproblem was published in Annalen der Physik. And it was not uh, just one paper. It was uh, in four different issues. It was a long, extended set of four-part paper uh, published in what was really the Annus Mirabilis for Schrodinger. Uh, it was an amazing year, 1926. And this is more or less what he got the Nobel Prize for seven years later. Uh, and uh, Feynman, in his famous Feynman Lectures of Physics, asked a simple question, where did he get that equation from? And he has a simple answer, nowhere. So according to Feynman, it's not possible to derive it from anything you know. It came out of the mind of Schrodinger, invented in a struggle to find and understanding the experimental observations of the real world. That's perhaps a contradict, uh, controversial statement. People do make efforts to derive Schrodinger equation. In fact, some of them use Feynman path integrals. But it's a somewhat different equation than most equations of physics. You don't start with a field that you understand and derive its properties from, from the mechanics or the physics of what's going on. It sort of invented a whole new kind of physics, quantum physics. So there it is again. There's the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. I have now dropped the constants, but otherwise it's the same. And very often, one doesn't solve that. One instead so solves the time-independent Schrodinger equation, which is this eigenvalue problem. That's why the paper was called quantization as an eigenvalue problem. So what's the eigenvalue problem? You take the operator acting on the wave function on the right-hand side. That's called the Hamiltonian operator. That's here. It's typically in physics rep called, represented by a capital H of it. And you apply capital H to a time-independent wave function, C, 
and look for an eigenvalue. So you want a non-zero psi um, such that it's equal to lambda times c for some, well, it has to be a real number because it's a self-adjoint operator for some real number lambda. Psi shouldn't be zero, but of course we were interested in psi with L2 norm equal to one, the normalization, uh, which you can always take So you t if it's an eigenfunction. And I've numbered the eigenfunctions and the eigenvalue by n, because typically there's a sequence of eigenfunctions, uh, or in some cases a continuum of eigenfunctions. I'll mainly be thinking the case where we have a sequence of fundamental eigenfunction with eigenvalue lambda 1 and so forth. And what's the relationship between the time-independent Schrodinger equation and the full equation? Well, it's, this is what you come to if you try to solve the full equation by separation of variables. If you take any eigenfunction, Cn, of the Schrodinger equation with eigenvalue lambda m, lambda n, then if you simply multiply the, eig the eigenfunction by e to the minus i <laughs> lambda nt, that gives you a solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And if we have a complete set of eigenpairs, then a linear combination of these will give you the general solution to the Schrodinger equation. And to keep it normalized, the coefficient should add up to one. So the takeaway message from this is that if you're trying to understand the behavior of a particle, or more generally a system of particles, in an environment governed by a potential function v, it's determined by finding the eigenvalues and eigenfunction pairs, lambda and cn, of the Hamiltonian minus Laplacian plus v. OK, so let's take a look at uh, quick examples. There's the, how, there's the uh, Schrodinger eigen value problem, the time-independent Schrodinger equation. Suppose first the potential is zero, so we're just talking about eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. I've taken the case of a square with periodic boundary conditions. So the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian is zero, with an eigenfunction as being a constant. So I've drawn a constant here. Um, <coughs> The other ones are, the, well, they're all of the form sine mx times cos my, or sine mx times sine my, or so trigonom products of trigonometric functions. So there's the fundamental mode, and here's, say, the 57th mode is some product of trigonometric functions. What happens if you have a potential, though? How does that change it? So here I've had some smoothly varying potential. It varies between roughly 0 and 200 or so. And uh, what happens instead of getting a constant for the fundamental eigenvalue, you get a sort of s slowly varying function, a near constant. Instead of getting a trigonometric function for the 57th mode, you get something that's nearly a trigonometric function. So now I want to make one difference. I want to introduce a potential that's highly disordered. So here's a random potential with random number values uh, chosen between 0 and 100,000 or so, assigned to the squares of a checkerboard as random numbers uniform in that distribution. So I take my domain, I cut it into little squares, and I take a piecewise constant potential where the constant values are random. That's sometimes called an Anderson-type potential or continuous Anderson potential. So what do the eigenfunctions look like? There's the fundamental mode and the 57th mode. So they're totally different looking. So the takeaway message from this is that disorder changes everything. You have this complete localization of eigenfunctions that appear to be essentially appear to be zero in almost all the domain except some small little piece. So first of all, that can't be true. Uh, you can easily prove that the eigenfunctions are p positive everywhere, but they're extremely small here. They die exponentially away, so they look to be zero to our i. And immediately lots of questions come to mind, like why did it localize? When it decided to localize, why did it decide to localize right here rather than some other part of the domain? What about the scale of the localization and so forth? So those are questions we want to get to. And then, like Christoph said, do we want to get to these because this is an important problem or because it's scientifically interesting? Well, both. Let me give you some evidence that's an important problem. This is from one of the collaborators in our uh, Simons collaboration, Jim Speck, who has a lab in uh, Santa Barbara. This is an atomic probe tomograph of uh, an indium gallium nitride, aluminum gallium nitride LED. So this is a tiny device constructed by the physicists. And what they've done with this uh, atomic probe microscope is they've mapped out the position of every atom and the type. So the green atoms are gallium, the red atoms are aluminum, the purple atoms are 
indium, and you can see in this little blow-up of a small piece of it, although they've constructed a device with certain properties, there's nonetheless a great deal of disorder here at a fine scale. And this disorder is what, as we saw yesterday, changes everything. It's an important property of the device. It's not something you want to get rid of, it's something you want to work with. And so understanding uh, the electric and electronic properties of a device like this requires the understanding of localization of Schrodinger eigenvalue problems. Okay, I mentioned the name of Anderson. Localization is probably most closely associated with Anderson um, because he got the Nobel Prize for the metallic insulator transition being uh, based on localization. So the very rough argument is that electrons are traveling through a metal, say a metallic alloy, and you add some impurity to that alloy, and that will decrease the mean free path of the electrons, and the conductivity of the sample will go down. Add more disorder, the sample becomes less conductive. You might think it will steadily tail off towards zero, but that's not what happens. Because of complex quantum effects, what actually happens when you reach a certain critical level of disorder, conductivity disappears completely. The electrons don't go anywhere, they localize. So mathematically, that's saying that the uh, Schrodinger Hamiltonian is localized if V is sufficiently disordered. Uh, Anderson had the kind of potential we were talking about before and showed that its amplitude is large enough then uh, you have localization. In his Nobel Prize lecture in 1977, he made the following statement, localization has yet to receive inadequate mathematical treatment, and one has to resort to the indignity of numerical simulation to settle even the simplest questions about it. Well, I've already talked about how inappropriate it was for me to be speaking about Schrodinger equation. Even worse is to correct the Nobel Prize winner, but let me reword that slightly. As, of course, Computation has progressed since 1977, and now I would say, fortunately, numerical simulations can be used to illuminate many questions about it, and I'll try to convince you of that. And before I go on, let me just quickly mention this. This came out of another one of our collaborators, uh, Marcel Faloche. Uh, this is a points to the fact that localization doesn't only happen in the Schrodinger equation, and it doesn't only happen because of r disordered coefficients. It happens in almost any wave equation, can localize, and disorder can be in the geometry rather than the coefficients, and that was exploited to create this noise uh, abatement wall, which is in use in parts of France and has won prizes for being the most effective noise abasement rule. It uses disorder to localize the eigenfunctions of the acoustic wave equation and stop the wa waves from propagating. Okay. So I've introduced the Schrodinger equation and localization. Now let me introduce the landscape function, which was the other element of the title. Before I do that, let me just mention an exercise from Quantum Mechanics 101 in every Quantum Mechanics book. A very simple example of localization is computed. So there's no disorder here. There's a little bit of interesting geometry. This is a single square well. So we have a potential that's zero, say, on the unit interval, and some value nu outside that interval, and we want to compute the eigenfunctions of the Schrodinger equation in this simple 1D example. And what you can easily see, you can write them down by hand in terms of exponential functions and trigonometric functions. And what you see is that the wave is not quite localized. It's very localized to a region a little bit larger than the square well. If the walls of the square well are, are infinite or virtually infinite, then it would be uh, completely localized to the unit interval. If you take rather walls that are high but not infinite, it tunnels out a little bit, but it decays exponentially away, and so forth. And this can be done in higher dimensions and so forth. So does this give us an answer of why those eigenvalues in my first slide were localizing so much? Well, we didn't see anything that looked like a well in that disordered potential. Um, but a big step was taken in that direction by Agman, who showed how to push this argument for the square well, which depended on exact solutions, to much more general potentials. Let me review that quickly. So he introduced something called the Agman distance, and that works as following, follows. 
So I'm going to introduce a function on the plane, and the function on the plane, or on the space where we're working, is going to be equal to the difference between the potential v at that point and some energy level, some eigenvalue lambda. So you take your potential v, you take an eigenvalue lambda, you consider the difference. If it's positive, that's your function. That's v minus lambda plus. If v is less than lambda at that point, like in this well, you set it equal to zero. And now you take that as a conformal factor to define a Riemannian metric. In other words, you measure a distance, and the distance is weighted by how much v is greater than the eigenvalue. And that creates a metric in the sense of metric spaces. You can take the distance between any two points by taking the shortest path measured in this weighted distance. So that's this formula here. The Agman distance made with respect to a potential v and an eigenvalue or energy level lambda between any two points is the shortest path measured with the velocity vector being weighted by this um, function. <clears throat> and then Agman was able to prove under various assumptions, suppose you have a regular potential, so not a piecewise constant, but a, a smooth enough potential, and suppose it stays above lambda outside a compact set, then for any alpha less than one, let's pretend, let's be mathematicians and let it go to one, so pretend that alpha is equal to one, uh, the integral of the exponential of the Agman distance of x from a fixed point like the origin, weighted by times the eigenfunction, if you take the L2 norm of all that, if you square that and integrate it, it'll be finite. And so what does that say? That's since this is exponentially growing in the Agman distance, that can only be finite if the eigenfunction is exponentially decaying in the Agman distance. So this is a proof that eigenfunctions decay exponentially under the circumstance that the potential is regular en enough and stays out greater than lambda outside a compact set. Unfortunately, that's one of the most important tools in localization theory, but it doesn't apply to our problem, at least not directly. Let me take a, an extreme example to make it very clear. Let's take that as a potential. So what's my potential? Again, I divided the square into 80 by 80 subsquares. Um, and then I set each subsquare, I set the potential either equal to zero or a positive value, four. And I did it with a, a coin, and it was uh, weighted coins. So 30% of the squares have a positive value, and all the other ones have a zero value. 30% was chosen because it's below the percolation level, which means that the, it, the white squares together form a huge connected set. This pink area is all made with white squares, and it's connected. So that means the Agman distance between any two po points in the white squares is zero. You can travel from one to the other without any potential at all. So Agman's distance is zero, so exponential decay doesn't tell you anything. So you can't apply Agman theory to a potential like that. And in fact, most of our random potentials have that problem. However, you can go compute the eigenvalues with your computer, and these are the, that's the fundamental eigenvalue and the second eigenvalue with that potential. So we need an explanation why these localize, and of course we're still interested in why did it localize here and there rather than somewhere else, and why did it localize to the degree it did and not more or less. Okay, so here's where the landscape function enters. This was done by uh, two of the members of our collaboration, Svetlana May Baroda, who's the director of the collab, and Marcel Filoche, who I mentioned before. In 2012, they sort of kicked off this subject by introducing a very simple idea. They defined the landscape function as the solution to minus Laplacian u plus v times u is equal to 1. You just, not an eigenvalue problem, a source problem with the simplest possible source, one. And then there's a rather easy estimate that you can prove, just uses the maximum principle, that says if you ha take this solution u and you take an eigenpair of the Schrodinger equation and you normalize the eigenpair not by L2 norm is one, but L infinity norm equals one, then the eigenfunction is bounded by the landscape function times the eigenvalue. So as I say, this is a fairly elementary estimate to prove. What does it mean? Well, I understand things better with pictures and computation, so let's look at the computation here. Um, 
So here's a potential in just one day. I took 64 random numbers between 0 and 8, and that's my potential. Then I solved this problem, minus u double prime plus v, that potential times u is equal to 1, and I get this landscape function. Then I went aside and I computed the eigenfunctions, the first four eigenfunctions of uh, this problem. And I normalized them by 1, but I multiply them by their eigenvalues. So I plotted them here. Here's the fundamental eigenvalue, this red guy, and the height is the fundamental eigenvalue. The red guy is the eigenfunction. Um, Sorry, it's the reciprocal of the fundamental eigenfunction. So since this is the fundamental with the smallest eigenfunction, it's the tallest. And this is the second eigenfunction, and the third, and the fourth. And you notice, according to this, if you take the eigenfunction, multiply it by the reciprocal of the eigenvalue, it stays less than the green function u. And you see that happens. That's the content of the faloche maber roda theorem. So what does this have to do with localization? Well, they had the following somewhat questionable argument. They said, we have this um, landscape function u, and the eigenfunctions have to stay below it. So if the landscape function has a peak, and then it goes down and has low valleys, then the eigenfunction has to have low valleys. Since it has low valleys, let's say it has to be 0. Well, that's the sort of weak part of the argument. So it's since going to be essentially 0, that means it's going to be a Dirichlet eigenfunction in the region deliminated by those valleys. And in fact, it'll also be a Dirichlet eigenfunction in the complement of that region. But those two regions probably have different eigenvalues, so it can't be an eigenfunction of both. Of bo it'll have different eigenvalues, only and therefore, one of them has to be 0. So the eigenfunction will localize in the other one. So the reason I, it's not a very real argument is it's true that these things have peaks and have valleys that drop down. It's not true that the valleys force the thing down to zero. So being lower than the green line doesn't really force the eigenvalue to go to zero. <clears throat> Let's do a place where their argument actually applies directly. I took this domain here, two rectangles with a thin neck between them. All the localization is going to come from the, this this neck over here, I solve the landscape function. So I solve minus Laplace in u, no potential. Minus Laplace in u is 1 on that domain with Dirichlet eigenvalues. And I get a picture like this. You can imagine if there was a membrane in the shape of that domain and you put some pressure on it, it wouldn't move very much in the thin neck because, the, because of the geometry. And the result is that we have a deep valley in the landscape function as compared to the peaks over here. So what does that mean? That means that the eigenfunctions are going to all tend to be either stuck in this piece or in this piece. So let's see if that's true. There's my domain, and there's the first 50 eigenvalues of the domain. So the smallest eigenvalue is over here at around whatever that is, about 8 or something like that. And the next eigenvalue and the next eigenvalue working its way up to 300. Now let me plot on top of that the eigenvalues of the blue domain, the larger rectangle. Those are the blue dots. And you see they lie right on top of some of the eigenvalues of the double domain. And there are the red ones are in, over there. And you see the first 50 eigenvalues really divide up between eigenvalues of the left domain and eigenvalues of the right domain. And you can see it more clearly if you look at the eigenfunctions. There's the first 48 eigenfunctions of the uh, composite domain. This one is just the fundamental of the right domain. This is the fundamental of the left domain. This is the second mode of the right domain, the second mode of the left domain, the third mode of the right domain, the fourth mode of the right domain, and so forth. They all 48 of them really localize to one domain or another, as predicted by the landscape function. If you go up to the eigenvalues 200 to 250, it's still true for many of them, but we begin to get delocalization like this one here, which lives in both domains and mostly lives in the neck itself. So that's a real simple example of localization and it being predicted by the landscape function. But as I say, the landscape argument is a little weak, and we improved it working together in... Um, this was in a paper in PRL in 2016, where we introduced something called the effective potential, which is something very simple. 
It's simply the reciprocal of the landscape function. And how does that come in? Well, what we did is we take the Hamiltonian and we conjugate it by multiplying by the landscape function u. So take this function u, multiply any function phi by u, apply the Schrodinger Hamiltonian, and then divide by u. That gives you a new operator, and you do the math, and you find out that the new operator itself divides up as a differential operator plus a potential. And the differential operator is a little complicated. It's not quite divergence form. It's divergence form with a density, 1 over u squared in the front. Um, and the potential is not complicated. The potential, instead of being v, is now 1 over the landscape function u. So that's why this word effective potential, it says that you can think of the landscape function, well, in fact, it's reciprocal as being a potential itself, an alternative to v. And now, what's the point of this conjugation? Well, if you take any operator and you conjugate it by some other operator, you don't change its eigenvalues. And you change its eigenvectors simply by the thing you conjugated with. So the eigenvalues of this new operator, L plus W, coincide with the eigenvalues of the original Hamiltonian. And the eigenfunctions are just related in a simple way. The new eigenfunctions are 1 over U times the old eigenfunctions. What's the advantage of this? Well, the new function, well, what is the new function? It's 1 over U, and U is the solution to this landscape problem h u equals 1, so u is a pretty smooth function. It has at least two derivatives. So 1 over u has at least two derivatives. So it's much better than this piecewise constant potentials we had before. And here's an example. So this is 1 over u, the landscape function, w, for the Bernoulli potential I showed you before, for this potential here. So that crazy function that has no wells becomes this nearly C2 function that has, clearly has wells and walls around them. I've, I've uh, colored the crest lines of it, and you can see there are many little regions surrounded by crest lines. Or and this is a picture of the same thing. There are many blue oceans surrounded by green walls like that. Okay, so that's what we see by looking at W, which we couldn't see by looking at V. And that's sort of the sales point of this uh, landscape theory, the effect of potential. We claim that this is what the wave is paying attention to. The wave is seeing, when it looks at the potential, really sees this effect of potential. Um, so I got, I've gotten to W is confining when V is not. I'll explain this later, why v, W accounts for more of the energy than V. Um, and then the main idea is to say, well, now we have a potential, an effective potential, that has wells and walls, so we can try to use the Agman distance for it. And that was the beginning of a theory that proved something about um, the, the use of the landscape function. And finally, that's a picture of an example of the, the W, the effective potential, in three dimensions. I've colored different level lines of it, and what you see, maybe I should stop it somewhere. Oops, not there. This is a good one. So here what you see is a very deep well, surrounded, red well surrounded by higher purple walls, surrounded by higher green walls. So that is a confining potential. That's the kind of place where an eigenvalue will um, localize. If I had looked at the original potential, which was a bunch of random numbers, I would have seen nothing. Okay, and here's an actual theorem that came out of this. This was published in Communications and PDE earlier this year. Um, and it's probably not worth reading exactly, but the basic idea is that the eigenfunction decays like the exponential of an Agman distance form, not with respect to v, which we saw in some examples wouldn't decay at all, but an Agman distance form with respect to w, the effect of potential. And when we had this theorem, it gave us a new thing to look for. This is an explanation of localization. It's exponential decay of eigenfunctions. But this says that the eigenfunctions decay whenever the effective potential is greater than the eigenvalue, whenever w minus lambda plus is positive. That happens not only 
right near the eigenfunction, but it happens all across the domain. So here I've taken one of these random potentials, I've computed the effective potential, and I've plotted its walls. And you see it has walls, it walls in all sorts of areas. It's basically the same picture we saw earlier here. There's lots of uh, wells surrounded by walls in this thing. And according to the theorem, the eigenfunction will decay whenever it crosses those walls. You can't see it here because after it crosses the first set of walls, it's decayed to so near zero, it looks like nothing's happening. However, that's not the case if we take the log. So here I've done a log base 10 of the same thing. And what you can see is that the eigenfunction changes by 14 orders of magnitude in this picture. It goes from brown to red to orange to yellow to light green to dark green to cyan to light blue to dark blue. Each one is a change in order of magnitude of the potential. Um, that's predicted exactly by the effective potential. Okay, and now I want to sort of take my point of view on this issue, which is, well, the landscape function has a lot of information about the localization. Can that give us a way to compute eigenvalues and eigenfunctions? So the computation of eigenfunctions is not an easy problem. I, computing many eigenfunctions of a PDE is a much more difficult problem than, say, solving the PDE. So there's a lot to be gained here. Instead of computing all these eigenfunctions, we solve one PDE, the landscape equation, come take its reciprocal, and somehow try to exploit that to get the eigenfunctions. So that is what I'll talk about in the rest of the talk. And I'll start it off with a game. This game in English is called Where is Waldo? I think in German it's Wo is Walter. Is that right? So that's Walter. But for us, Walter is going to be an eigenfunction. And this is the disordered landscape that the eigenfunction is walking in. So this is my potential. I've taken the interval from 0 to 256, and I've divided into 256 unit intervals and assigned a number between 0 and 4 randomly to each of those intervals. And your job, if you want to play this game, is to tell me where in this landscape Walter will show up. Where will the fundamental eigen <coughs> function of the Schrodinger operator with that potential localized. Anyone want to guess? I should say I played this game with Jim Simons when we got our Simons grant, and he didn't get it right. OK, well, you might guess, the easiest guess would be here. That's the deepest well, but it's awfully narrow. You want to, you have a better choice? Very good. I think that's right. I, no, it's not. Uh, <laughs> but it's awfully close. So now let me make it easier and let's see, you get to play again. I've plotted the same potential in gray and I've also plotted the effective potential. So that means I solve one PDE and I took a reciprocal, that's the effective potential. You want to guess now where to localize? That's the deepest well. So now I'm going to plot the first four eigenfunctions. Well, those are the, the um, local minimum of the effective potential, the deepest, the second, the third, the fourth. And now I'll plot the, no, this is still not the eigenfunctions. This is my prediction for the eigenfunctions. They'll occur here. And where did I get the width to them? Well, I have a simple rule of thumb. Take this number, multiply it by some constant like one and a half, and take the level sets one and a half higher than this. So that also gives me a prediction of depth. So that's my prediction of the eigenfunctions. The first one will show up here and be roughly this wide, the second one here and so forth. Now I'll compute the eigenfunctions exactly and plot them, and th there they are. And you see we've got the positions exactly right, and the widths give us a general area. So in this simple 1D method, this simple 1D example, this method works pretty well. Okay, you get another chance. What about this potential? It's the same. What's the difference? There's one thing different between this potential and the previous one. The labeling on the y-axis. It's much higher amplitude. The last one was 4. This is 256. So this is going to show you how nonlinear the landscape function or the effective potential is. I solve the landscape equation and invert it, I get that effective potential. That looks totally different than the other one. And that one 
selects here as the deepest. One, two, three, four. So it selects totally deepest, different places. It's a very nonlinear process. And we can do the same thing with level sets and get a width. And we get this prediction. And it's smack on for where the eigenvalues are in order. So how about this potential? This was one of the tough ones we've said before, where it's going to localize. So it's really very difficult to see anything in this picture. But we solve the landscape equation, invert it. We get the effective potential, which I showed you before. The blue sea surrounded by green shorelines. And you look for the local minima, though. There are the four deepest local minima. And there are the sublevel sets surrounding it. So that gives me this as a prediction. And that's the actual eigenvalues. And I'll overlay them so you can see what a perfect match they are. Of course, there's this fudge factor in the sublevel sets. If I had made it wider, they would have uh, opened up and surrounded more of the eigenfunction. If I made it tighter, they would have closed down. <clears throat> OK, it's not always perfect. And I think I'm not going to, I'm just, because I don't have so much time, I'm going to rush through this. But in this one, it didn't get them in quite the right order, because they're nearly double eigenvalues. But let me move on. Can we learn some more of that? So we found that the effective potential tells us where the eigenfunctions localize, at least with some accuracy, um, and sort of to what extent they localize. What if we want to know more about their structure? Well, for that, we turn to the Agman distance. Um, we had the theorem that said very roughly that the eigenfunctions decay exponentially, behave more or less like uh, the, ag the ex negative exponential of the Agman distance to the central point to the, of the eigenfunction. Now, what, what do we know? We know how to comp estimate the central point of the eigenfunction as a local minimum of the effective potential. And we know how to localize, well, I haven't said yet how we localize the, get the eigenvalue lambda. That'll be coming. Um, so if we knew lambda and we know x0, of course, we know the effective potential, because we solve the landscape function and take the reciprocal. So we can compute this right-hand side. So this gives me the following algorithm. Oh, and how do you compute Agman distance if you know w lambda and x0? Well, the Agman distance, any weighted distance, is solves an iconal equation. So you solve the iconal equation, and that's what the so-called fast marching method was invented by, invented for by Jamie Sathian and others. Um, so what I do is I find x0 and lambda. I estimate lambda in a way I'll tell you later. Then I compute the uh, Agman distance and the effective potential. Well, I need that to compute x0 and lambda. Um, <laughs> I compute the Agman distance by solving the, the Econel equation. And then I estimate the eigenfunction by sticking in the solution here to taking the ne negative exponential of the Agman distance. So let's see that in practice. So this is that 80 by 80 Bernoulli potential that we've been looking at a lot that had it localized in a region like this. And this is the actual eigenfunction. And this is what you get if you estimate it with the Agman distance in the way I said. So this is very cheap to compute. This is not so cheap to compute, especially if you want a lot of eigenvalues. And it looks pretty good. But if you look carefully, you can see there's a lot more structure here than shows up here. This is slightly too fat. And if you actually measure it and say L2, this is not so close. This is maybe a 20% difference. <clears throat> but it, it certainly holds out some hope. If we look at it on a logarithmic scale, remember we had this, this is a different example, but remember I had this logarithmic decay of the eigenfunctions over, this is uh, base e instead of base 10, so this is still about uh, uh, 10 orders of magnitude or 12 orders of magnitude. And this is what happens if you just take the log of the exponential of the Agman distance, which is just the Agman distance you get a pretty good ma uh, match for it all the way out to 10 orders of magnitude. So there is a lot of information in this Agman distance. Here's the second eigenfunction, the third eigenfunction, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. Now here we see some problems. The sixth eigenfunction is not essentially positive like the other ones. It has a big negative region. You obviously don't get that as an exponential of an Agman distance. And so we've lost the sign information. And we're still struggling about how we're going to get control of eigenfunctions to change sign. 
And the higher you go in energy, the more of those there are. There's the uh, seventh eigenfunction. The eighth one, we've got the wrong eigenfunction. This is the correct eigenfunction, we've got something else. And if you want to know what we've gotten, go not to the ninth, but to the tenth. What we had computed, the order is different. So that can happen, that the local minimum are not quite in the right order, especially when there are near ties. Then you end up comparing to the wrong eigenfunction. This shouldn't be regarded as a big mistake. They, we've gotten, we get both of the eigenfunctions, we get them slightly out of order. But that's the sort of issue you have to deal with. And now here's an idea to maybe improve on this. As I said, it's only 15, 20% correct, but now we could use that as a starting point. So what do you do if you're trying to solve some big system of equations and you have a good guess? Then you do Newton's method and it converges very fast. How fast? Newton's method is quadratic. If you have two digits correct, after one iteration you get four digits correct. Another iteration you get eight digits correct. There's something like that for eigenvalues called Raleigh quotient iteration. Uh, I've written it down here, but I, maybe I won't go through it in detail. If you have a good initial guess for an eigenvalue, you solve one equation with, your, with the matrix that you're trying to take an eigenvalue for, and then you form the Raleigh quotient to update the eigenvector and the eigenfunction. That converges even faster than Newton's method. It's cubical. If you have two digits correct, after one iteration you have six digits correct, and another one you have 18 digits correct. You're way into round of error. So we could do Raleigh quotient iteration with uh, these Agman distance estimates. So here's the true eigenfunction. No, sorry, here's the true eigenfunction here. Here's what I estimated before using the Agman distance, which is a little too fat and a little too vague. It's lost information from this. I do one iteration. I can't see the difference between these two or between the next iteration. So one iteration of Agman estimate is probably enough to get the accuracy that's needed. So we have to solve one equation to get the... Um, effective potential, and then one more equation for an Agman, for a Raleigh quotient iteration. Okay, and let me uh, now turn to estimating eigenvalues quickly. So how do we get eigenvalues, not just eigenfunctions, out of this uh, effective potential landscape theory? This will also show you why I say the effective potential contains more of the energy than the true potential. So here's the simplest bound on eigenfunctions that's well known to many people. If we have an eigenfunction, let's say it's normalized, so it's L2 norm is equal to 1, of the Hamiltonian, minus Laplace V times C, plus V times Psi integrated against Psi, that's the energy. In physics, more physics notation than direct notation would be written like this, same thing. So just because of the form of this, we can integrate the... Laplacian by parts and get the L2 norm of the gradient squared, and the other term is already in a positive form, and that's written the energy of the system as the kinetic energy of the system, the L2 norm of the gradient squared, plus the potential energy of the system. Then to get a simple lower bound, you throw away the kinetic energy and just keep the potential energy, so it's the integral of V C C. And uh, since C has been normalized to be one, this thing is greater than or equal to the smallest value of V. So that's the simplest estimate you could get, which says the energy of the system is bounded by the infimum of the potential. Unfortunately, for our potentials, that's a pretty useless estimate. Here the potential is 64 random numbers. The infimum of V is the smallest of these random numbers, which is practically zero. If you pick 64 numbers, one of them is going to be very small. And all you're learning is that the eigenvalues are greater than zero, which doesn't tell you anything. But now let's conjugate. So now I take my Hamiltonian and I write it as a... I've conjugated in the reverse direction of this new effective Hamiltonian, L plus W, divided by, divide by U, apply L plus W, multiply by U. That, that's equality, because the way we defined L plus W. I remind you, here's the definition of L, and W is 1 over the landscape function. And now if we look at this, well, multi dividing by U, multiplying by W, and multiplying by U, the U's go away, so the last term is WC, and the first term I just wrote it over again is this here. Now do the same thing. Multiply this by C, integrate to get the energy, 
So that you can either, so this thing here is the same as this thing here. And now this term is again positive. Why is this positive? Because the u squared tells that u to the minus 2. And so this is the divergence form operator. We can integrate by parts and get something positive. So I throw this away. But now what I keep has a w in it instead of a v. It's greater than the infimum of w. Now look at the picture like this. The infimum of w is the deepest blue point. So it's right here. That is a reasonable lower bound. It's much larger than the infimum of v. So we get a worthwhile bound on the eigenvalues out of this simple argument. Um, and what you see here is that in both cases, we've divided the energy into the two pieces, one piece coming from the potential or the effective potential. In the other piece, the thing we threw away was almost everything. And the effective potential didn't hold that much, at least when we went to its infimum, when we went to an eigenvalue that stuck in uh, one of the wells. Uh, we didn't throw so much away when we used the effective potential and we get a good bound. True eigenvalue and the bound. OK, now, this is a slide I better skip. Maybe I'm lucky because it's a little bit of a crazy argument. Um, this is an argument that's based on this picture of the landscape function apparently related to the eigenvalues by a constant. These are not equal. The, theory, the theorem says that the red line is below the green line, but there's clearly a gap there. And this is an attempt to compute the gap. And by an argument that I won't go through, we're led to that the gap by a rule of thumb is something like 1 plus d over 4 times the minimum of the effective potential, or 1 over the maximum. Of, uh, lambda is the reciprocal, so it's 1 over the maximum of u, which is the minimum of the effective potential, and d is the dimension. So takeaway message, this gives us an algorithm. If we want to estimate the eigenvalues, we compute the effective potential, we compute its minima, multiply the minimum by 1 and a quarter in one dimension, 1 and a half in two dimensions, 1 and 3 quarters in three dimensions, 1 plus d over 4, and that's an estimate for the eigenvalue. How well does it work? Well, here's a two-dimensional case of one of those 80 by 80 uh, squares with 80, 80 squared random numbers. These are the real eigenvalues, the first 100 of them. These are the minimum of the effective potential. And if we take their ratio, it stays very close to 1 and a half, as predicted. If we do the Bernoulli potential, it's not quite as good. It's more like 1.55 or something like that. And after about 20 eigenvalues, it wanders and gets more like 1.7 or something like that. This is a different potential, a correlated one. It works very well for it. So this gives us some rule about the eigenvalues. And I'll skip these. But I'll, let me show you this picture. I like this picture. For here, what I've done is I've done in both 1D, 2D, and 3D on the same graph, I've computed the fundamental eigenvalue for a random potential. And I did it for, I think it was, 25 or 50 different random realizations of the same potential. And the fundamental eigenvalues are those blue dots in one dimension. Then I did the same thing for the 10th eigenvalue and the 25th eigenvalue as the triangles and the squares. And you see that they all line up pretty well on the line that goes through the origin and has slope 1 and a quarter, 1 plus 0.25. Then you do the same thing in t with two dimension. And they line up on the line with slope 1.5. And you do the same thing with three dimensions. They line up on the slope with uh, 1.75. So there was a statement about this by Carlo Bienacker for the Journal Club of Condensed Matter Physics that picks out a paper and recommends it each month. This was the recommended paper for August. Uh, and he said, to appreciate how astonishing this is, imagine someone telling you of a new method to find the eigenvalues of a large random matrix. For us, it's eigenvalues of a random differential operator. I invert the matrix, that solved the landscape equation, sum the rows, well, that's because the right-hand side is constant 1, sum the rows to obtain a column vector, and then search for local minimum and its reciprocal elements. This sounds like a crazy method. But figure two shows it works for localized eigenstates. Figure two was a version of this. OK, and I'll close with estimating the density of states. 
for many purposes, like to calculate absorption and other things, you want many states, uh, maybe even more than there are local minimum of the landscape of function. One thing to do is to try to use Weyl's law. So Weyl's law for the Schrodinger equation says you go into phase space, x is position and z is dimension, and look for where the kinetic energy plus the potential energy is less than some energy level E, divided by some factor involving pi, and that's an estimate for the number of eigenvalues less than E, the counting function. And that's supposed to be accurate, well, it's provably accurate, as E goes to infinity for certain classes of potential. And here's the picture. That's the eigenvalue counting function. The first eigenvalue is 0.3, then this jumps up by 1, and then there's another eigenvalue that jumps up by 1 again, and you get this step function, which is the counting function NE. And the green is exactly the right-hand side here, the Weyl's law. And it's not very good at estimating the number of small eigenvalues, but asymptotically it's correct. So now let's do that same computation, except replace V by the effective potential, the one that we claim that's what the wave sees, and you get that orange line. And you see it's zero for a long time. It jumps up exactly at about the right place and so forth. This is a blow up of that small area there. So we found this astonishing, and, and we don't have a good theoretical uh, justification of this, how well the effect of Weyl law does compared to the true Weyl law to estimate the, the integrated density of states. These are some more examples, and the only one I'll show you here is these first two. This is the random Bernoulli potential. It's either zero or one. Half the, this is a fair coin. Half the time it's zero, half the time it's one. We get that crazy effective potential. We plug it into the Weyl law, and we get a pretty good match for the counting function. The true Weyl law doesn't care about the order of the zeros and ones. It only cares about the number of zeros and ones, and that's why it comes up to be two sideways parabolas. Then we did the example of zeros and ones only alternating, just a periodic potential. In that case, you get a totally different effect of potential. As I said, the true Weyl's law doesn't care. It gives you the same sideways parabolas, but the effect of potential is spot on again. And as my last example, let me show you the density of states rather than the integrated density of states. The density of states is essentially a histogram of the eigenvalues. And this was a long computation I did. I took a 1D potential, but with a half a million pieces. So random numbers between 0 and 4 are a half a million of them. And I computed all the eigenvalues less than 1 in absolute value, less than 1, of which there were 7,122. That's a big calculation, because it's a lot of eigenvalues of the differential operator. That's about 40 CPU hours, even for 1D problem. Then I computed the effective potential. That takes very little time, even for such a big problem. And I computed its minima, and there are 8,000 of them less than one, and I made a histogram, and I get this histogram. So this histogram is for free, and you can see the different, uh, can you see, uh, I guess you can see the difference if I bounce back and forth between them. In particular, this tail, which is of great interest to the semiconductor physicists, physicists the Urbach tail, can, can be roughly estimated without going through computing all the eigenvalues. Okay, so I'll conclude. The takeaway message is that this landscape function or effective potential is easy to compute, but it seems to contain an astonishing amount of quantitative, deterministic information about the spectrum of disordered Schrodinger operators. It looks at the specific disordered potential. It doesn't state something about the statistics of all realizations or something like that. It's deterministic information. The Agman distance associated to it is a powerful tool. Um, it can be in a way to get the kind of initial guesses you need for iterative algorithms. And there's many more questions than there are answers at this point and lots of directions to go into uh, in the future. And I'll just mention, um, these are the three papers that I talked about fairly specifically. They have the same group of five collaborators. Um, and this is the wave collaboration PIs, all of which have really contributed to this work. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Doug, for a really wonderful talk. Uh, and thank you in particular for confirming that there is no indignity in computation at all, not that we needed proof of that. <laughs> so I'm sure there are some, some questions. Yes, please. So I have much less experience, but the answer is yes. That, I mean, and I did show that example of the noise abatement rule. That's the acoustic wave equation. Uh, that was, but that was disorder from geometry. So if you take a fractal, a Cox snowflake or something like that, and compute the eigenvalues of the Laplacian, which are um, then give you the eigenvalues of the wave. The, eigen, the solutions of the wave equation, you will get localized behavior. Um, you can also look at a, an equation like divergence of A grad U, where A is disordered, and use it to induce localization. But I better not say too much about it, because I don't know the exact limits and of where it applies. I think it's. Or is it just a localization thing that uh, sort of drives it? Well, thus far, the landscape theory works when gives us useful information when it leads us to an effective potential that has wells and walls. And that's more or less what the theory says. How much that's the limit of, of it, I'm not really willing to say. My co collaborator, Svetlana, is much more. Uh, outgoing on this subject, but I'm cautious. If I haven't yet computed it, I'm, I'm not willing to stake a claim. We did see in this one example of a periodic potential that the effect of vial law was perfect. There's no localization going on there. Those, there the uh, eigenfunctions are black waves. So, um, so it's not strictly limited to localized behavior, but I don't want to make claims that I can't uh, support. Please. I wonder what happens if you have degenerate eigenvalues. Is this a problem? Or? Degenerate means multiple? Yeah, the same eigenvalue for the Yeah, the answer is yes, we have them, and yes, it's sort of a headache in this following sense. Take a lot of random numbers as your potential. Then what you're going to get is you're going to get localized eigenfunctions. They're going to see the same sort of patterns over here and over here and over here. They're going to occur almost all over the place. And actually, the theorem would say, if we take Anderson's theory in the one-dimensional case, take, take um, the whole real line. So his theory, his theory and most things proved about uh, Anderson localization are proved on the whole space, not on a finite domain. But, so to take the whole space, it says that the spectrum is entirely point spectrum, only eigenfunctions, and that it's dense above a certain level. So that means that you get infinitely many eigenvalues as close as you want. You, for any closeness you want, to, for any number, you get infinitely many eigenvalues getting as close to it as you want as you go out. And we sort of saw that picture, remember, in the very first slide I showed on localization, I showed the first eigenmode, which was uh, thin peaks pointing straight up, and the 57th eigenmode, which looked almost exactly like the first one. It just happened somewhere else. The same sort of basic configuration of random numbers happened in different places. That'll happen again and again. So our eigens, our spectra, tend to be very dense, many eigenvalues very near each other. That's why it's almost hopeless to try to match a one-to-one -one matching between the local minimum and the eigenvalues, because they'll get out of order, because they're near ties. So it doesn't really matter which one you say is a little bigger than the other. But the positions of the eigenfunctions then change grossly. It makes it hard to even state a theorem about what you're trying to prove. You have to be very cautious about making a conjecture about what you could prove in such a circumstance. So yes, they happen, and yes, they do make things complicated. 
Well, there's probably many people who could answer this better than I can. I can tell you about the things I've come in contact with. So the collaborators in this collaboration, by the way, probably the key point of this collaboration is like the SE itself, this is basically half physics and half mathematics, ranging from fairly pure mathematics like David Jerison and Guy David to very applied physics like Jim Speck. So what people like Speck and Weisbuch are interested in is designing devices like LEDs, for example. And what they want to see is not just one state. They want to see, so, so they're trying to do self-consistent Poisson-Schrodinger calculations that involve many eigenfunctions for the electrons and many eigenfunctions for the holes. And they want to see the overlap of the corresponding eigenstates, compute integrals that'll tell them things like absorption and things like that. So they're interested in for a specific realization or a realization that has similar statistics as the ones that they're going to seeing in the laboratory. They're interested in computing lots of eigenpairs for both the electronic Schrodinger equation and the same equation for holes, uh, and, and then matching them for the specific potential to see how they match up. And for that, they need lots of eigenfunctions. And, uh, <coughs> What they found so far is calculations that would have taken them a year if they were computing all the eigenfunctions. They're reducing to hours using uh, predictions of the eigenfunctions with landscape theory. More questions? Yes, please, Andre. So everything I showed you was periodic boundary conditions. It would have made little difference. I started out doing Dirichlet boundary conditions, and then it's a little annoying that it goes to zero at the end, so the landscape function is zero at the boundary, so the effective potential is infinity. It's not really a problem, it just... And then I, we went to Neumann boundary conditions. Problem with Neumann boundary conditions is the pictures aren't as pretty because they see the boundary, and your maximums tend to be near the boundary fairly often. So I just did periodic boundary conditions. What would be difficult, of course, is doing all of space, which brings in its own simplifications and its own complications. It's not so great for numerics. <laughs>